it could well be the brutal end for the Battle of Aleppo. First a siege, then weeks of carpet bombing, followed by a ground offensive, have uh, Damascus and its Russian and Iranian backers on the brink of victory in the city once known as the Jewel of Syria. However, that won't end the civil war. As tens of thousands of civilians flee, persistent reports indicate that rebels of various stripes are also on the move to try and fight another day. What's next after the flattening of uh, Syria's former commercial capital? How will Turkey, now actively involved in the conflict, react? We've been hearing mixed messages there. And how about Washington? Right now, it's the dying weeks of the Obama administration. Can a President Trump, who's vowed to wipe out ISIS, wash his hands of all else happening in Syria? Today in the France Vent Get debate, is it all over in Aleppo? With us from Beirut, reporter Rania Abu Zaid, a new American fellow, the working title for her upcoming book on Syria, No Turning Back. Nice to see you again, Rania. Thank you. From Washington, Michael Pregen, adjunct fellow at the Hudson Institute. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Francois. Julia Théron, political scientist at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po's Saint-Germain campus. Thank you for joining us. Hi. And Anton Kozlov, who teaches at the American Graduate School here in Paris. Welcome back as well. The uh, France Vent Get Debate, where you can join the show on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24Debate. In the past few days, the Syrian army has recaptured one-third of the rebel-held eastern parts of Aleppo. That has triggered a mass exodus. Those fleeing talk of starvation and incessant shelling. Rescue workers in the rebel-held section claim uh, 45 killed in a bombardment on Tuesday. We've had scores more already on Wednesday. Rescue efforts, though, still persist. One charity sent images to partner station France 2. It's a report read by Catherine Viette. An ambulance races through the streets in eastern Aleppo. Let us pass. Get away. Move. Move. Syrian rescuers are looking for the area where a bomb has just been dropped. I hope there won't be a second one. Residents point the way as dust and debris float in the air. That's good. Stop here. The bomb has destroyed a building in the neighborhood. Where did it fall? We need help. Don't stay there. What's left of the building is now unstable. Is the girl okay? Look out. Be careful. Don't move the rubble. Stop. Stop. Go slowly. Among the rubble are those who've been injured. Give it to me. This rescuer is carrying out a teenager. Let's go. Amidst the chaos, they bring her to the ambulance. This same scene has been played out hundreds of times. Before the war, these ambulance drivers were electricians or tailors or students. Now they work for the French government-funded NGO Syria Charity, helping the injured, and they've begun filming their daily lives. In this war, children are still the first victims. After yet another bombing, they find a group of children wandering alone inside a house that's just been targeted. What are you doing here? Come, come, you must go out quickly. My mom, my brother. Get out, get out quickly. Where is your mother? On the fourth floor. We'll go up and see. Can your mother move? I don't know, I don't know where she is. Go out, children. All of you. They will be saved, but left behind is their older brother dead under the rubble. And their mother, seriously injured, will be rescued a few minutes later. According to the UN, 100,000 children are still in the besieged rebel zones of eastern Aleppo. As fighting intensifies, fears grow about the fate of those left behind. Julia Terrell, your reaction to that report? 
Well, it's pretty simple. I think that if uh, anybody plans to stop a radicalism by backing these kind of actions, I think it's a mistake. I think that um, you can't end radicalism by bombing massively civilians, including children. I think that it's, a, it's used to be the realists who say that we are realists, we have to work with Russia and the Syrian regime to end, uh, to end ISIS. So first, there's no ISIS in Aleppo. So there's the uh, Jabhat Fatal Sham, the Al-Qaeda linked uh, group, but not only. And there's massive amount of civilians, which uh, this kind of action is completely forbidden by the international humanitarian law. And regarding to pure strategy, I think it's counterproductive. Rania Abu Zaid, your reaction? Well, these images have become sadly very familiar, and it seems like the world has grown numb to seeing the suffering of Syria's uh, civilians. That is certainly what I hear on my trips into Syria and what I hear when I try and communicate with people that I have been in contact with for years. They feel abandoned by an international community that doesn't seem to care about what happens to Aleppo's children on either side of the, of the, uh, of the front in Aleppo. Uh, so, you know, as your former guest said, uh, radical elements within the Syrian opposition uh, exploit these uh, feelings of abandonment and they, uh, you know, often say, look, nobody else is standing with you, but we're here with you and we're fighting and dying for you. And, you know, when, you, when you're desperate, uh, any man with a gun who will try and protect you or your family is welcome at that point in time. And this has to have, you know, we have to think about long-term consequences of uh, such uh, perceived inaction by, you know, so this is how <coughs> Syrians on the ground in these besieged areas feel. So, yeah, because sadly, there already is a precedent inside Syria, the city of Homs, which was bombed into submission. Uh, Rania Abu Zaid, how's it looking for Aleppo on that score? Well, you know, it certainly looks like we're um, witnessing the imminent fall of the uh, rebel-held eastern part of the city. Um, you know, there have been a number of instances in the recent past when it looked like uh, eastern Aleppo might fall. However, given the massive Russian and Syrian bombardments and the fact that the city has been uh, besieged for many months it, the, and the, the rebel uh, forces have been softened up, if you like, by these uh, starvation and siege tactics that the regime has employed in many different population centers, it looks like, you know, the, this is going to be a massive blow to the uh, armed uh, Syrian rebellion. Michael Pregent, do you agree with the other guests that uh, this uh, carpet bombing, the shelling of rebel-held areas can only encourage more radicalization? I completely agree with, with your other panelists. Uh, the major issue here is the U United States and the international community is, is allowing this to happen and has allowed it to happen over the last five and a half years. So, so that narrative that Putin and Assad keep trying to push, that it's either the Assad regime, Iran and Russia, and this alliance against ISIS, the Jabhat al-Nusra, and other al-Qaeda uh, affiliates like uh, maybe Ahrar al-Sham. So this, this uh, rebel stronghold in Aleppo that's being targeted now, if the UN doesn't get involved, if the United States doesn't ask for safe passage out for these civilians, if the United States doesn't, doesn't demand a halt of this indiscriminate targeting of Aleppo, you're literally looking at Assad, Putin, and Iran solidifying that narrative that it is us against them because there will be no rebel control of any territory if this is allowed to continue. So 50 days from now, when a new president takes over, that argument will, will be made. It's either us or them. Michael, and, and Trump Michael, has hinted... Michael, Yes. Michael, Michael Pregen, on this point, uh, we've seen uh, the U.S. Secretary of State still trying to hammer something out with the Russians. We've heard the French uh, ambassador to the United Nations in the past 24 hours saying, quote, France and its partners cannot remain silent in the face of what could be one of the biggest massacres of civilian population since World War II. We haven't heard right. anything from President-elect Trump. Why not? We need to. You're right. We haven't heard anything yet. Uh, the one thing that, that we did hear is that he's looking at Mattis as a secretary of defense. If Mattis is chosen and if he accepts a position, he has a very strong anti-Russian aggression stance, also a very strong anti-Iran 
uh, expansion stance. So that would signal to Putin and Iran that the administration would change course. It would also signal to get as much as you can in the next 50 days ahead of this new administration coming into office. We should hear something from Trump. Uh, already he's, new, he's, new named, he's, named, uh, General, he's already named General Flynn as his national security advisor. Right. General Flynn with cozy ties with Moscow. Uh, has that not uh, given Putin the signal that it's a uh, fair game to, uh, to continue? Well, no, no, listen, uh, I'm a former intelligence officer and I would jump at the opportunity to sit at a dinner table and meet President Putin and shake his hand and look into his eyes because he'll, he'll know that you know more about him than his countrymen do from intelligence reports. So I don't fault General Flynn for meeting with Putin. Any intelligence officer at that, at that level would have done that. Uh, remember, General Flynn, I've known him since 1997, grew up in a, in a, the Soviet Union and now Russia is a geopolitical foe. So he grew up that way, he believes that. He, he, would, he would actually advise Trump that I, Russia is not targeting an ISIS. They're not targeting Jabhat al-Nusra, that they're actually targeting uh, U.S.-backed rebels. So Flynn is not this pro-Russian guy that everybody says he is. He's an intelligence officer that's known uh, Putin, KGB, Russia for 30 plus years and remembers very well that they are a geopolitical foe. Anton Kozlov, how do you see the, the sort of the fault lines shifting around this issue of Aleppo and Syria right now? Well, I think Aleppo is most likely will be taken by the Syrian government forces. Now, regarding the strong statements coming from the White House in the coming days or months, I think the real issue is whether the United States or its European allies are willing uh, to commit ground troops in order to stop the civil war, because the Russians are willing to do that, and the Iranians are. <clears throat> Nobody else is, is, is ready to go on the ground and to do something. So, of course, the Russians will have some, somehow tactically at least, uh, uh, an upper hand in the situation. Uh, whether it's going to end the civil war, no, it's not going to end the civil war. The civil war will continue, uh, even if the rebels are uh, pushed out of uh, uh, big urban centers, they're going to continue to fight. So. Uh, I don't really see, uh, I mean, we hear a lot, a lot about uh, the willingness to end the war. I mean, we've been hearing that for the past five years, but nothing had been done about it. Well, I mean, let's be clear. Yeah, I, I take the opportunity to say that uh, it's very important indeed uh, not to remain silent, like you actually said, Francois, but it's also uh, very important even more not to stay inactive because there's a huge difference between uh, condemning uh, acts and uh, acting against them. But you heard Anton say that short of being able to commit ground troops, what else can the rest of the world do? Not a very long time ago, the uh, EU Council of Ministers, uh, Foreign Affairs Ministers, uh, decided to condemn Russia for what is happening in, in Aleppo, but not to take steps against it. So it's not only about soldiers on the ground. I think that there's a possibilities regarding to Europe and soft power, for instance, that we could take more sanctions against Russia. We could, uh, for instance, we took some sanctions against uh, heads of intelligence and military uh, uh, soldiers who are responsible for the situation in Aleppo. So th we freeze the their uh, money in Europe and we forbid them to uh, come in Europe. That's very weak. We can do way more regarding to this simple point. And regarding to the soldiers on the ground, well, Russia uh, does not have, at least officially, perhaps a little bit of, but uh, they don't have a huge contingent uh, in Syria on the ground. Iran might, but it's mainly uh, Hezbollah and, and uh, Shia militia. So, I mean, it's not much regarding to the soldiers on the ground, but at least uh, international pressure, diplomatic and economic. Anton Kozak? Well, Russians, in fact, they do have, they may not have an army there. I mean, we're talking, we're not talking about, you know, even tens of thousands, but they do have private contractors. They have regular troops. They 100, have, we say. Yeah. Oh, more than that. Oh, of course, more than that. They have a number of military bases. They have a military base in Palmyra now. They have military base on the coast. I mean, they have they have troops. They have advisors. I mean, and now they this war led to the creation of Russian private military uh, companies. So they certainly uh, and one important thing that I think we have to keep in mind that Russians maintain 
pretty uh, uh, still, despite the fact that they lost a lot of their influence over uh, their former uh, uh, former current Arab allies, they do maintain a, net, a network of contacts that are quite important uh, in Syria, uh, which I don't think uh, the United States or the European powers have. Rani Abu Zaid, what's the perception right now when we see what's going on in Aleppo of the United States and of Russia, where you are in Beirut? Well, I can tell you what the Syrians uh, tell me, and that is that, you know, look, at the end of the day, there's only one side that has planes in the air, and that is the Syrian government and their Russian allies. And that has always been uh, the, the key thing that rebels have called for. I've never met a rebel group that asks for foreign boots on the ground. They just want to ground the planes, because that is what gives the, uh, the you know, I mean, let's be clear. Uh, the regime has won back. It's made huge territorial gains after and because of the direct involvement of the Russian military uh, on the Syrian battlefield. And that's when we really started to see the regime win back a lot of territory that it had uh, lost in the previous years. So it's really all it's really about the planes in the air <coughs> and uh, the regime's ability to just really punish its opponents uh, in a way that they sort of can't uh, retaliate because they simply can't ground those planes. And uh, what's your, what are your thoughts when you heard Michael Pregen say, wait, don't pass judgment too quickly on someone like Michael Flynn, who's uh, uh, been seen to have, uh, to have uh, very flattering words for Moscow and has had in the past uh, been, been photographed uh, with Putin, for instance? Well, you know, we're, we're all waiting to see what kind of a team uh, President-elect Trump assembles, and it seems to have some contradictory figures. Uh, but, you know, I mean, he has also said that he believes that uh, President Assad is fighting Islamic State, so let him just go ahead and do that, reinforcing that narrative that one of your earlier guests said about how, you know, uh, President Assad is basically trying to say to the world, it's either me or them, them being the men who carry the black flags. So, you know, we've heard President-elect Trump uh, say this. So it'll be interesting now to see what uh, influence the various members of this, uh, the team that he's assembling will be able to exert on him and, and his thoughts. All right. There's, of course, other players in the Syria conflict. When we come back, we're going to take a specific look uh, at uh, conflicting words out of Ankara and Turkey on this. You're watching the France 24 debate.